Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Clapper, and recently there's been some concern and some downright confusion regarding whether people eating a completely plant-based, that is a vegan diet, should routinely be taking a supplement of DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, which is a long chain omega-3 fatty acid that the body uses in hundreds of different vital structures and functions in our cells. To supplement with the HA or not to supplement with the HA? That is the question. And it has proven to be one of the most difficult issues in nutritional medicine that I've had to consider in my career. So for the next 19 minutes or so, I'm going to share my thoughts with you about both sides of this issue. And because this is such an important topic and I don't want to forget any points to share with you, I'll be reading many of my words off a teleprompter so if from time to time my eyes drift down and it looks like I'm reading off a teleprompter, it's because I'm reading off a teleprompter. But my connection with you is very important. And I, so I'm going to ask your understanding if my eyes occasionally drift down uh, to read my words instead of looking directly at you. That is because I really want you to get all the important points I want to share with you. So now back to the DHA issue. One side says humans just don't have the enzymes to make DHA in their cells on enough level to keep their brains healthy. So vegans should take supplemental DHA lest they risk brain shrinkage, Parkinson's disease, and dementia. Hmm, quite a problem. For the folks who recommend against taking DHA supplements, they say, listen, your liver makes all the DHA you need. Uh, if you eat enough of the fatty acid precursor, ALA, in your diet, in dark green leafy vegetables, the ground flax seeds, uh, soy products, etc., there's plenty of ALA in your diet, uh, and just give your liver enough, it'll make all the DHA that you need. Which side is right? Unfortunately, at this time, in early 2020, the nutritional science is just too primitive to give you a definite answer as to which side is right. No studies have been designed or done to answer the three really key questions we need to know. One, does clinically significant DHA deficiency exist in vegans eating an ALA-rich diet? Those folks who are having big salads every day, big plates of steamed green vegetables, and putting in at least one tablespoon, if not two tablespoons of ground up flax or chia or hemp seeds into their salad dressings or into their oatmeal every day. Folks who are eating in this style, day after day, week after week, month after month, do they not gear up their enzymes to make enough DHA? Do they really get DHA deficiencies? That's the first question. Second, if low DHA levels are found, um, do they contribute to Parkinson's disease or dementia? Uh, accredited dementia researchers around the world do not list DHA deficiency as a cause of dementia. Not even a vegan diet is on the risk factor list. So is this a real connection we have to be concerned about? And three, does taking a, an algae-derived DHA supplement prevent dementia or Parkinson's disease, especially in long-term vegans eating an ALA-rich diet? We have no reliable answers to those questions. And if you are taking an algae-based DHA supplement to prevent dementia, know that you're doing so just upon the clinical intuition of a nutrition-based doctor. And it's more of a clinical hunch than solid science. So, could there be any harm in taking the same amount of DHA that you'd be ingesting? Now, if you ate salmon a couple times a week, I used to think not, and I used to take the algae capsules myself. But as a physician and as a student of biology, I've learned that in something as complex as the human body, you can't do one thing. You can't do just one thing. Everything is connected to everything else, and every medication, every hormone, every nutritional supplement sets off cascades of reactions that often show up as time goes by as unintended and sometimes unwelcome consequences. For instance, we learned the hard way that high-dose vitamin A leads to hip fractures in women. Who knew? We learned the hard way that taking beta-carotene supplements, if you're a smoker with an early lung cancer, makes your lung cancer grow faster. Who knew? We play this out daily in the medical office when the doctor thinks, I'm going to give this child an antibiotic to cure his ear infection. 
Well, that's what you think you're doing, doctor, but you're also killing off good microbes in the child's gut that will allow pathogens to flourish, invade the gut wall, increase the gut permeability, and maybe allow food proteins to leak in the bloodstream that flow through the bronchial membranes that make his asthma worse. You can't do one thing. Everything sets off cascades of reaction, and that's my concern about DHA. Let's look at some of the basic science about how it's made. When the, when the body's functioning normal without taking DHA supplements, the 18 carbon atom long ALA molecule is lengthened in the cells to 20 carbon atom EPA, and that in turn is lengthened once more into 22 carbon atom DHA. Well, we've recently learned that taking preformed DHA retards the metabolism of the EPA one step below it. As a result, the EPA starts backing up and it accumulates in the tissues. Is this a good thing? Nobody knows. But people who regularly take preformed DHA from algae just to make sure may be creating this EPA backup in their tissues. What, what if it's doing that? What else is it doing to these delicate enzymatic and cellular machinery mechanisms throughout our cells? Nobody knows. Are fatty acids building up with the EPA in my cells and uh, being oxidized and generating free radicals in my eyes and my brain because the EPA is not being metabolized? Nobody knows. But if you're taking isolated DHA, you're creating that effect in your tissues. Is this benign? Don't know. But the adage, do no harm, applies to dietary advice as well. We just don't know what we are doing. On another level, we know that when we take DHA and EPA regularly as in a supplement program, these flexible snake-like molecules accumulate in the cell membranes, and there they increase the permeability of our cells, not only to nutrients, but to toxins as well. Now, I live in South Florida, and in the drinking water, there's carcinogens like trihalomethanes and nitrates. Does taking DHA every day make my cells more permeable to carcinogens and thus raise my risk for leukemia or some other malignant disease? Nobody knows. But what good is taking DHA to prevent dementia when I'm 90 if it opens the door to carcinogens to kill me with leukemia at 78? In the body, you can't do one thing and we really don't know what we're doing. At least I don't know what we're doing when I'm telling people to take uh, these long-chain fatty acids. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, and DHA is one, has long been suspected of making cell membranes unstable and possibly increasing uh, their chances uh, to undergo malignant degeneration. And there has been published research by reputable investigators connecting high levels of DHA with prostate cancer. And my uncle Al died a gruesome death from prostate cancer that had spread to his bones. And taking these algae oil capsules made me think of my uncle Al almost every day. It comes down to DHA metabolism being a complex and subtle mechanism that's interconnected with the most delicate cellular chemistry in every tissue. And to me, crashing in with a fixed dose of DHA supplementation day after day, month after month, feels like I'm using a blunt instrument to repair a fine watch, all the while maybe chasing a deficiency that likely doesn't exist. My liver probably makes all the DHA I need. As a result, I just no longer feel comfortable telling people who are eating an ALA-rich diet, including a tablespoon or two of ground flax and chia seeds most every day, to spend hundreds of dollars each year to swallow an algae oil supplement that alters their natural EPA metabolism, likely makes their cell membranes more permeable to toxins and carcinogens, has never been shown to prevent dementia, and has been associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer. All the while, their liver is likely making all the EPA and DHA they need. I just don't feel comfortable making that recommendation for the general vegan population. Now, I don't want to be too black and white here. I am quite open to the possibility that new research may change my mind regarding DHA supplementation for most vegans. Dr. Furman may well prove to be right here. And there do seem to be people with diabetes, high blood pressures, advanced years who do have biochemical difficulty converting ALA to DHA. And these folks may legitimately benefit 
from taking preformed DHA? These are complex questions that need to be answered with high-grade research. And I hope it's done in the near future because we need the answers. I'm not saying there's no use for DHA supplements, but we need to refine our focus much more than we are now. For now, we just don't know enough to make any research, any recommendations based on solid science. Now, Dr. Joe Furman is a good friend of mine, and I so appreciate his contribution to nutritional medicine and to public education, especially about plant-based diets. And the last time we spoke, he's a convincing fella, and he did convince me that taking DHA supplements uh, was a good idea. Since that time, I've come to my current belief that I'm uneasy, saying that DHA for vegans is definitely a good idea. So I've pulled back with that recommendation. But Dr. Furman rightfully put in a video that Dr. Clapper has changed his mind. So here I am jumping horses again, and this, this is my change, not Dr. Furman's. I apologize to Dr. Furman and his listeners and to any of you uh, who might be confused by my evolution of thought here. But at this point, uh, Dr. Furman and I are respectfully and with great affection agreeing to disagree on this just one point. I agree with, uh, with his teachings and uh, he's a good friend and, and valued colleague of mine. So, uh, now that I've clarified my change in position here, what, what approach makes sense at this time? As I said at the beginning, I've got no clear-cut answer for you in 2020. Hopefully by the end of this year, I will. But here's some strategies to consider. First, I strongly suggest you use this point of controversy as a moment to optimize your own diet and promote your own DHA production in your body to the max. That means eating a diet daily featuring a big colorful salad, um, hearty um, uh, uh, vegetable soups, big plates of steam, uh, dark leafy steam greens, um, uh, whole grains, soy products, tempeh, tofu. Uh, and, that not, and these salads not only give you the ALA, they also give you the vitamins and minerals and cofactors to help your liver turn the ALA into DHA. Very importantly, find a way to take at least one tablespoon, which does meet your Institute of Medicine's requirements for ALA, but I'm a two tablespoon fan myself. Get a tablespoon or two of ground flax seeds, chia seeds, or hemp seeds, or ideally a mix of all three, and blend it into a smoothie, mix it into a soup, stir it into your oatmeal, sprinkle it onto a salad, I don't care how you get it in. But once a day, get a tablespoon or two of these uh, ground flax seeds in uh, to make sure you get enough uh, ALA. And I travel a lot, so I take my ground flax seeds with me on the road and I add a couple of tablespoons uh, to my morning oatmeal uh, in the hotel. So first, eat lots of ALA-containing foods. Second, minimize or better eliminate uh, those factors that might be slowing down your own DHA production. Drinking alcohol to excess, and uh, as a teetotaler, any alcohol to me is in excess, but less is more when it comes to alcohol. Um, dr eating these omega-6 heavy oils, these industrial oils, cottonseed oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, that are used to fry the chips in and make the processed foods. Don't be eating those uh, edible food-like substances in brightly colored packages and boxes. Uh, and third, if you've got type 2 diabetes, work with your doctor uh, to eliminate that disease. It's a reversible disease. Uh, go to pcrm.org and check out their diabetes uh, guidance there. And get a great book uh, called Kicking Diabetes by Brenda Davis, RD, a dietitian. And you'll have all the information you need to reverse that disease and, and uh, thereby upgrade your own DHA production. Should you get your blood tested to determine your DHA level? I wish I could tell you that well, if you're not supplementing, at least check your blood um, to detect any deficiency. But at this time, the blood testing situation is far from ideal. The two types of tests commonly done measuring either lipids floating freely in the blood, the plasma lipids, or the fats in the membranes of red blood cells, that's the omega-3 index, uh, that look at the fats over the past four months, uh, they both these techniques have defects that severely diminish their clinical usefulness to me. 
Uh, the plasma lipids are strongly influenced by one, the, the fat you've been eating in the week or two before you get the blood test, not reflecting true fat balance in your tissues. And second, the plasma level in the blood of DHA is determined by how quickly the DHA is cleared out of the blood stream. We have enzymes to clear the DHA out so they don't oxidize. So a low DHA level might really just reflect efficient clearance of the fatty acids out of your plasma rather than a dietary deficiency saying you need to take more DHA. So the test doesn't tell us a whole lot of valuable information. And the same with the omega-3 index uh, that measures lipids in the red blood cells. Uh, this seems to be a technically difficult test to do because the results vary widely from laboratory to laboratory by a factor of three. Uh, a 2% at one lab might be a 6% at another lab. You know, it's hard to know what we're looking at. The, uh, uh, the values just aren't consistent enough to make them useful to me. But no matter how the technical measurements are done, we are far from understanding what the numbers are really telling us. What is happening out in the bloodstream with these tests is only crudely correlated with the chemistry that really matters. And that's the chemistry happening inside the nerve cells of your brain and what's happening inside your peripheral nerves, what's happening in the membranes of your muscles and in your liver cells and in the interstitial spaces between the cells. That's where DHA measurement uh, really needs to be done. And these blood tests are such a crude, limited window into this complex functioning of the body. They're, uh, they're, to me, uh, they're semi-useless at this point. And it's going to take skilled researchers years of more well-designed studies to understand DHA's true role in the brain and to devise tests that actually assess tissue and dietary adequacy. But until we have a better understanding of what these blood tests are telling us, I don't feel comfortable telling people to go blithely dumping in preformed DHA uh, into their tissues without knowing really what it's doing, nor how to really accurately assess it. So I stopped recommending DHA and I stopped taking the supplement myself because I really don't know if I'm helping my body or I'm harming it. Now, my good friend Dr. Furman likely thinks I'm taking a risk with people's brains by not recommending widespread DHA supplementation. And he advocates DHA supplementation out of a sincere belief that he's helping his patients who are at risk. But as I said at this time, I'm far from convinced that such a strategy will either prevent dementia or not raise cancer risk. So uh, uh, Dr. Furman and I are going to agree but disagree on this one point. But I so respect uh, his work and his advocacy of plant-based diet that, uh, that our friendship and collegiality uh, proceeds uh, undiminished. But it comes down that every person needs to gather the best information they can and make the best decision for themselves. Remember, none of the studies indicating low levels of DHA in tissues have been done on vegans eating an ALA abundant diet like I described with ample amounts of greens and ground flax. The vast majority of studies on DHA production have been done on people eating omnivore diets, wherein the preformed DHA they eat in the meat every day probably down-regulates their enzymes that produce their own DHA in their cells, so it gives us the impression that everyone has difficulty making DHA out of ALA. But these studies give us no insight into the, the long-term physiology of the pure plant eater who eats foods brimming with ALA month after month. We know the liver is capable of increasing the activity of its enzymes over time, and that's where the research should be directed. In the few DHA studies that did include vegans, no accurate food records were obtained, so we really don't know what these people were eating that may have created any low levels that were obtained. But we can't let the lack of meaningful studies deter us from healthy plant-based eating. So, in wrapping up, I suggest you do what I'll be doing. For the next year, all through 2020, optimize your own DHA production, as I outlined earlier. Lots of dark greens, ground flax seeds, whole grains, soy products, and the occasional handful of English walnuts. This should be a safe and reasonable strategy for everyone. No one should suffer adverse effects from eating such a diet for a year. Second, eliminate those factors that inhibit your own DHA production, the alcohol, the omega-6 oils, the type 2 diabetes. And third, know that I will be carefully following the nutritional literature throughout this year about this important subject. And towards the end of this calendar year in December, I will post a report as to what I learned 
read DHA metabolism, and about testing for DHA adequacy, since new testing techniques are surely going to be developed and refined during the year. I'll post my experiences uh, with my own ALA-rich eating, along with the results of any blood testing I think is worthwhile, and I will share my further thoughts with you on DHA supplementation. So, in the meantime, optimize your own DHA production. Uh, it's got to be a good and safe thing to do. And besides, the nutty flavor of the ground flax and chia seeds really start to grow on you after a while. It's certainly happening with me. So thanks for listening. I know it's been a bit long, but I think it all needs to be said. So I'll be in touch as I learn more about this important dynamic subject. I'll carry you in my heart, and I want you to take care, eat healthy, and make every bite count.